just to provide you an overview, uh, we will uh, talk a little bit about what our infrastructure needs are and what our siting obligations are and the toolkit that we use for uh, both uh, de for decision support. I'll illustrate that a little bit with data collection and alternatives evaluation, talk finally about making decisions and some of our success uh, indicators. Southern California Edison is one of the largest uh, of the U United States electric utilities, serving 14 million people in a 50,000 square mile area. Uh, the map illustrates that we cover about a third of the state of California. One of the uh, characteristics of our system is that we already have integrated uh, more than 17% now of renewable energy and have obligations to we integrate even more, and about a third of the new projects that we face in the siting arena will be in renewable connections. Just to tell you, to show you the geographic the spread of these uh, areas, there are four areas shown here that have largely solar and wind generation opportunities, and we have uh, a spider web of system reinforcements that will be required to bring that energy from fairly remote areas in our deserts and mountains into load centers in our cities. So by, in summary, we have a very large service territory with new responsibilities for connections in a very complicated regulatory environment that now has uh, renewable energy incentives as well as a very complicated roles and responsibilities between these generators, which are not the utility, and Southern California Edison that has largely transmission responsibilities. And of course, there are multiple stakeholders. Many of the renewable facilities are on public land, so we're dealing with the Bureau of Land Management, the uh, and Forest Service, and other federal agencies that require also federal environmental documents as well as the state documents that we are required in the environmental arena to prepare. So turning to siting, we have a complicated siting environment as well. Our task is to identify, screen, and evaluate alternative sites and or routes for an electrical infrastructure project. Our task is to understand that project as well as its context in all of the dimensions uh, indicated here, the physical and natural context, the human and the built environment, and we're looking for that best fit. There is no right answer. It's a process that we have to engage in. So we're, my obligation is at the siting phase, when we know that we need a project and we start with a blank map. Uh, we use internal interdisciplinary teams. This is not a task that we give to consultants. If we had a, a tremendous workload and we were unable to perform this function internally, we would use outside consultants. But it seems that everybody in the company wants to be involved in this task, and it does set the stage for more successful environmental assessment when we're finished. So we've been developing procedures and institutionalized them, and it's taken project by project to make innovations, problem by problem solved, in order to come up with these uh, procedures. We're working at a stage when we have lots of locations and not very much data. The reverse is true. By the time we finish and we supply a project and uh, several alternatives to our environmental coordinators, they will be looking at lots of data in depth for those few options that are keep being carried forward. So there are some pressures on this siting process. We need a defensible process because it has to withstand the scrutiny of our management as well as our regulators. Uh, we have a lot of stakeholder scrutiny as well. We have to work smarter, faster, more efficiently to accommodate the larger workload that we are expecting. And we need to, we have been tasked with assessing a lot of risks very early on without the kind of information you'd really like to have. Uh, we want to reduce these, the surprises that 
that come later. So, and we, at this point, we don't own the property. We may have no way to get on a piece of property or on a line route. So this is a very in-depth uh, record search and uh, data gathering process. Our traditional process is boiled down to three steps as illustrated here from data collection on a study area that isn't always oval shaped or round shaped. We don't draw an oval around uh, some imaginary preferred location. We, we're, we spend a lot of time defining that study area. We evaluate alternatives that have been located within that area either by our real properties organization looking for a site or by our transmission people who are making the connections among the lines and then our final selection. I've identified tools, two kinds of toolkits that I'll explore here. One is more quantitative, but I'm not just talking about numbers. I'm talking about <laughs> tools that help manage information. So we have a lot of traditional tools, and you're familiar with those. Uh, GIS, uh, GPS tools now for field work, as well as photographs and visual simulations. Those have been a part of our toolkit for a long time. The electronic tools and models we've been developing over 15 years or so. Uh, capturing expert knowledge with, with systematic evaluation factors. Every discipline has now defined those key factors that they want to assess uh, one by one with every alternative that we look at. We have been developing field tools using GPS and tracking tools to even find where we are. The desert doesn't have street signs for us, for example. We've also been developing web-based applications that help add up all this information. That is numeric for us. And uh, although it's not the case now, our intent is to automate as much as we can, but never the decision making. No model makes a decision for us. I'm not sure I have the right term here either for what I'm calling qualitative, but this is the human part of making these decisions. Teamwork is very important to us, and one, even before we begin, our project manager will put a team together, and that team includes a variety of disciplines. We have about 15 categories of concerns that are measured with systematically with factors. One of the things that makes for more successful decision making is shared understanding of that project. It doesn't happen at the first meeting, it doesn't happen at the second meeting, it happens as we pour over the data together and share each of our concerns. We make our values explicit. What do we care about? Not all data is equivalent, and not all data for a substation is equivalent or has equal importance for the same for a transmission line. So we, we speak in terms of values as they need to be explicit and shared. We have, use all the facilitation techniques that you may have discussed in your public involvement sessions, but we use it within a team context and manage conflict, of course, if we're not in agreement. So taking data collection, you can imagine that this is more on the quantitative side of things. We're working with a lot of data with fairly standard tools. The purpose of our opportunities, concerns, and constraints process is to lay out in map form those areas that are most suitable for the facility that we need to build. And our task is fairly straightforward and it involves traditional techniques. I tried in blue to indicate those areas that are a little bit more subjective, a little bit more qualitative, because there's a lot of judgment involved in the interpretation of the data. Our intent is to divide those areas up into those that are more suitable and to indicate clearly those areas that are not suitable for our proposed facilities. So when we begin that opportunities, concerns, and constraints process, we're characterizing the study area, identifying existing facilities and even future facilities that may go into that area, along with subject matter databases and applying our GP. GIS tools. We're also assessing the community context in which this project will be built. 
So I have a picture of a, a Temesco Valley design guidelines. Well, that was produced by a public advisory group and we took into account the land uses that they proposed for the area near where we needed a very large site for a uh, substation. Collecting local knowledge and identifying our key stakeholders is more on the qualitative side of things. When we put it all together to analyze a project study area, obviously we're using maps again, but we're also holding workshops in which we try to meet face to face in which everybody shares what their concerns are. And over time, we've asked for them to be written down. Tell us what your constraints, opportunities, and concerns are with uh, each of the areas that they are responsible for. We finally have a map. I've only taken one illustrated here, a concerns map. You can imagine that we would be sitting down with our real estate people or our transmission people suggesting that they don't go where it's red or blue. Um, they have a triangular area, sort of a bird-shaped area uh, that they can work within, but please avoid the areas that are uh, problematic. Hopefully we'll rule out some of the the negative features that, uh, that could affect this project. When we turn to alternatives analysis or alter alternatives evaluation, now our real properties people have come back with some alternative sites. Our transmission people have drawn a lot of lines on a map. Uh, it's our task now to assess whether they are viable and whether they minimize potential concerns. So our task now is to apply those factors that we've been working on, measure them, determine how we aggregate them for an overall picture of our different alternatives. Our job is to rank the alternatives as best we can. So the inputs, again, we have to know where those sites and routes are. So we have a mapping step involved here. But the factor development is really a crucial step here. And fortunately, we started early on this, maybe 10 years ago, and the disciplinary groups have, have pretty much settled on their factors, and we are able to reproduce them uh, from project to project. We never keep them static, though. If we have unique conditions, if we had flamingos <laughs> in our service territory, we might have some new factors to consider and to add to the mix.